All right. We are going live and live. Now that we're done bouncing things around, per usual, I'm having some minor issues with technology. I'm just going to switch to different streaming software. I hear Twitch is good, but uh, what I'm using ain't working. This, this OBS Streamlabs one isn't doing it. So we'll give this a few minutes to fill up here. Anybody showing up? Yeah, I'm uh, struggling with technology again. So um, while we're filling up, I'm going to get all the uh, announcement stuff out of the way. I got a lot of stuff to talk about, a lot of channel announcements. And honestly, it's probably going to end up sounding like a bit of an infomercial here for the next couple of minutes. Uh, for starters, um, still selling patches. They look like that. Um, sold quite a few. I have them in red, blue, and grayscale. They're PVC patches. They're $8 if you want one. Uh, contact me at either Gunfather Milson Facebook page or gunfathermilson at gmail.com. That's the place to get a hold of me. It's $8 shipped in the U.S. If you want them sent to Europe, uh, the shipping is going to be like total to like $26. 20 for the shipping and you know six for the patch. It's it's not cheap to ship to Europe. I've actually sold as many in Europe and all over the world as I have here in the US. And I appreciate it. If I send you a patch and you receive it and you want to, please send me a picture with you wearing it on your gear or your equipment, and I'll post it on the Facebook page and, and all that. Uh CQB critique videos or airsoft critique videos. I just uh did another one. I think I put it out there last night. Um so I'm um, still accepting video from guys who want to do a CQB cr critique. Um, I don't think I'm too harsh. I think I'm pretty fair to people. And uh, it, um, hopefully people like it. It's still just a new kind of video type I'm trying to put out there, see if you guys like it or not. Um, I think they're kind of fun to do. Uh, the last guy uh, sent me probably more videos than I, than I needed. Uh, sent me like 18 videos, which is cool. I mean, I watched them all, but... Um, Two or three unedited, unedited videos is better. I, I prefer them totally unedited. If, if it's cut up and made to make you look amazing, I'm, I'm just not going to use it. Um, you, if you want, you can cut out the respawn walks, but I, I can cut those out myself too. So that's not that big a deal. So uh, send me some video and uh, we'll rack out a couple more of those as soon as I get some video for it. Now on to other stuff. Um, podcasts. I've been doing some podcasts lately, uh, about a year, oh boy, it's about two years ago now, I did one um, Gentleman Badass po podcast, my old coach, Mick Doyle, I did that one about a year and a half ago, do not talk about airsoft at all, but if you're curious about some of the real world stuff or my background as a fighter, um, I don't think it's particularly entertaining, but um, it, it, don't talk about airsoft, it's all about uh, squat crap and uh, how I used to be a fighter. Uh, recently, a few weeks ago, I did a podcast on uh, Trifecta Airsoft podcast. It was a lot of fun. It was a little bit over an hour long. I uh, really enjoyed it. So if I put a link to it on the Facebook page. Jump over to Trifecta Airsoft, check them out. Uh, they're a real good channel, and he does some really good interviews with uh, all sorts of people in the uh, airsoft industry, and he was nice enough to uh, accept my request to be on his podcast, and it was, it was a lot of fun. Uh, and next month, I'm going to be on Task Force Podcast, which is another Airsoft podcast. Uh, keep an eye out for it. I'm going to put a link to it so you guys can see it in the near future. Oh, finally, uh, looking at doing some T-shirts. Uh, I've had the design I want to use for Gunfather Milson T-shirts for quite a while, but I've been having a hard time finding the right kind of vendor and venue to, to sell those and to, to make those. Um, checked out a couple, just wasn't happy with the product or the kind of lack of control. Um, a guy I actually have played airsoft with on several occasions, his name's Eric, his company is unsavory tees. Um, check him out. He's a, he's a, <laughs> a conservative. Um, if you're, if you're conservative minded or you're, you know, liberty minded, he, he's going to have t-shirts that you're going to like on his, uh, on his webpage. So, um, but he started a t-shirt company. He's had it for a little while now. And uh, he reached out to me and said, hey, have you ever thought about doing T-shirts? I said, yeah, I, I got the design. I got everything ready to go. But I don't really have um, 
a t-shirt company goes, well, I just happened to have started a t-shirt company a while ago and I'm, I'm looking for more t-shirts to sell. I'd be happy to sell your t-shirts. So we're putting together proofs right now of what the Gunfather Milson t-shirts are going to look like. I think you guys are really going to like them. Um, the price is probably going to be about $25. Uh, you know, we're not making our, our, our millions off selling t-shirts, but we do want to make it a little bit worth our time. So, uh, but about 25 is what we're looking at. I'm trying to get um, uh, cotton blend. I, I don't like 100% cotton shirts because they don't really hold up very well. I want you guys to have a quality shirt that's going to last a while and that you can wear with pride. So, um, <laughs> wear with pride. But, um, so I'm looking for a, a blend, some sort of blend t-shirt that's going to hold up better and, and be more comfortable. So, uh, next thing, slings. I wanted to talk about slings tonight, and it's going to be kind of a bit of a neandering conversation. There's basically one point, two point, and three point. Three point slings are kind of went the way of the dinosaur. Oh, somebody just texted me probably something to the effect of, hey, idiot. Yeah, thanks, Bernie. You're on chat. I just can't see it. No worries. So as far as slings go, there's one point, two point, three point. Three point are old school stuff, like from the 90s. And three point slings kind of went the way of the dinosaur. They're kind of complicated. They're great if you're standing and watch for a really long time, or you're going to be standing somewhere holding a rifle for like hours and hours and hours, uh, because it really helps support the weight. And it, 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 it basically is designed solely for comfort and supporting the weight of the weapon. Nobody really uses them anymore. Uh, Two-point slings. Two-point slings are more common when you're maybe more precision rifle guns. And I like two-point slings for when I'm going to be walking a long distance with a rifle or uh, doing, like if I'm going to walk over a quarter mile, okay? Uh, they're also nice when you got to throw a rifle on your back to climb over a fence or climb up a really steep hill or whatever they, they keep the rifle very secure and they keep it from swinging down the, between your legs uh in my opinion the best kind of two-point sling right now is the magpul ms1 it's the cool one it's got this slider right here this is an example of one uh this is the padded version but i have a lot of them that are unpadded i use this sling quite a bit at work i really don't use this sling too much for airsoft but it's got this neat slider that you can adjust the length of it on the fly um, this is a great sling, kind of the ideal two-point sling, in my opinion. This particular one has QD mounts on both sides, and these go for about $75, pretty much wherever you buy them. Great sling, not the cheapest. Um, other sling I really like, and I did a review on this one uh, on the channel probably a couple of years ago, maybe a year and a half now, uh, the Advanced Gun, Fing Gun Slinger hit sling. Um, this is a really cool sling. It costs about $80, uh, not cheap. You can convert it from a one point to a two point on the fly. That's kind of the, the shtick. That's kind of the cool thing about it. This is the current sling I use on duty when I'm working. Um, only complaint I really have about it is the webbing, in my opinion, is not the most comfortable. But uh, it is... A very practical sling gives you a lot of options. If I ever got to climb over something, I can quickly switch to two-point configuration. But most of the time, I run around with it in one point. And by most of the time, I mean like 98% of the time, I use it in the one-point mode. Which lends the question, why did I spend all the money and have all this extra crap on here if 98% of the time, I don't even use it in the two-point mode? Not to mention, it's $80. It's cost prohibitive. Good question. So uh, that's when I decided I was going to try to come up with a better sling and, and build a better sling myself. So back in the day, we had this thing called a Black Hawk Dieter sling. I don't know who Dieter is. I'm sure it's some really cool high-speed tactical operator from the 90s or something because these things are pretty old. The nice thing about the Dieter sling is it's got bungees on it. It's got two bungees, one on each side. And each of those is actually a double bungee if you were to take this thing apart. And it's got this cloth covering that protects it. Okay. Um, and this Dieter sling uses HK clips, if you're familiar with them. Um, I've only had one of these break on me. They're not made of the best metal in the world. Are they strong? Yeah. I've never had another one break. 
The one that broke might have been made on a bad day. Might have had a micro fracture in there that got past QC. I don't know. Um, do I trust them? Yeah. Is it worth saying that one broke on me once? Yeah. So uh, this was my favorite sling for a while. Some issues I had with it is the webbing is not the most comfortable. It's it's basically standard sling webbing, and the cloth around the bungees kind of gets uh, annoying. Kind of gets in the way of things. There's a lot of material here that can get in the way of your rig and your reloads and whatnot. But I did like the bungee. So, and this is what I came up with. After I came up with it, I ordered all the parts, found a place to piece and parts this thing together. And I'm still working on the particulars of some of the hardware, but more or less, this is the finished product here. This is how it's gonna look. Uh, currently, I only have about 10 of these built. I got uh, five in black and five in tan. They're exactly the same. So what I was going for here was a sling that was uh, comfortable. First off, because you know me, comfort is king. I want it to be simple. I want it to be comfortable. I don't want it to be overbuilt. I want it to be affordable. And I want it to be strong enough. And I say strong enough because you do not need a sling that you can lift 500 pounds with. That's not realistic. The more weight, the more, the stronger your sling is, the uh, one, it's going to be more expensive. And um, two, you're just adding weight and durability that you don't really need for a sling. This one I've tested to 50 pounds. I've picked up a 50 pound weight with it several times. Never had a problem with it. Um, in my opinion, that's plenty. I haven't uh, tested it to, to a break point. The break point on the, the rating on most of these parts here that make this up is about 500 pounds. I did use tubular nylon webbing. Why? Because it's very strong and it's very comfortable. Um, I use this in repelling, tactical repelling. Anybody who does any sort of repelling knows all about tubular webbing. This stuff is the shit. It's got a 4,000 pound break strength. Neither here nor there. It's it's just, it's about 50 times stronger than I need. But I like tubular webbing because, as the name implies, I don't know if I can show you this, if you're going to be able to see it. It's it's kind of like a fire hose, right? It's a, it's a tube. And therefore, it doesn't have a hard edge. Okay, it's got a rounded edge. Although it's, it's a very small rounded edge, edge, it is a rounded edge. And therefore, it is very comfortable. Okay, it doesn't, it's not going to dig into your neck because of that rounded edge. It makes a big difference. Additionally, the reason I'm going to stand up and grab my M4. Because now I'm doing the mild thing. Got my ICS M4 here. The bungee part is supposed to go here across your chest. The reason I like the bungee part is instead of it pulling on your neck when there's some weight on it, it pulls on the bungee. So this part up here, this rounded tubular webbing that's up on your neck is not gonna move. It's not gonna dig into your neck because all the stress is taken up here by the bungee. I like bungee slings because they're convenient. They're easy to move around. Um, they're just very comfortable. And once again, they're strong enough. Notice this bungee sling does not have, I just used a 3 8 inch bungee strap there. It does not have um, it doesn't have that, that nylon webbing around it that you saw on the deer sling that gets in the way of everything. And I also only use one strap. Um, plenty strong. Once again, picked up 50 pounds, no problem. The actual attachment point I used was just a simple clasp. Um, the reason I went with this, I, I considered using HK uh, HK hooks and smash hooks and um, to some the de degree QD mounts. QD mounts are really expensive unless you buy like cheap ones like UTG ones. And those UTG ones, they're going to break. So I don't use those. Uh, but I, I went with this clasp because... Uh, you can put it on pretty easily one-handed. doesn't really matter which way it's oriented. It's easy to put on, easy to put off. And uh, it's strong enough to do what I want it to do. So this is more or less how this sling is going to end up looking the final version of it. I might change a little bit of hardware, but this is more or less it. I'm looking at selling these for about $30. I'm not making a ton of money on them. And they, uh, once again, I'm not, I got a real job. I'm not going to make my million selling slings. But uh, that's, that's 
less than half of the price of these other slings I really like. And I actually prefer this one since I since I made these and tested them out. I've been testing them for about the last two weeks. Um, I actually prefer this to the hit sling at work. I've been using this at work um, and it, it works great. So and I've been testing it a lot, you know, just around the house and on the range, <laughs> on the range quite a bit. I'm on, at work, I'm on the range every day at work, so I get a, plenty of chances of T&E new equipment. So uh, that's it. Gunfather bungee sling. Like I said, I only got uh, 10 of them made right now, 5 tan and 5 black. If you are interested in one, if you want to be like one of the first guys to try them out and, you know, actually write me a review and let me know what you think about it, what can be improved upon it, because it's kind of a work in progress. Let me know. Get a hold of me on uh, gunfathermilsim at gmail.com or gunfathermilsim on Facebook and let me know what you think of those slings or tell me you want one. $30 and plus shipping, I'll give it to you. So that is most of what I wanted to cover. I got to figure out how the hell I can see the comments. Oh, there they are. Finally, they're, they're coming in. All right. So outstanding. Um, I'm going to piece parts this all together later uh, when I re-edit it. Mark Carico, message your Facebook page, but I figured I'd comment here as well. I've had the same one point for about 12 years and I'm very interested in your slang. Mark, what kind of one point do you use right now? Let me know. And generally speaking, when I when I like a sling, I stick with it for a very long time. So I use that uh, that Dieter sling for many many years, and I've used my Gunslinger one for about a year and a half, and now I'm switching to my slings. Any good sling name ideas, feel free to throw those up there as well. Any woodland play tip tactics is best question. I think I have at the moment. Woodland play. Ben, weren't you asking me about making a woodland play video? Like five best tips for woodland play. I've kind of been trying to outline that one out in my head. And I guess we can hammer it out right now because uh, I was thinking about it the other day. The first thing for woodland play is wear camouflage. I know that sounds redundant and stupid, but a lot of people will show up, especially to uh, pickup games, and they're wearing jeans and a T-shirt, which is fine if that's all you have. But uh, Or they wear black. A lot of guys wear black, which is the absolute worst thing you can wear in a woodland game because it really, really stand out. You don't have to wear perfect, amazing camouflage, but ma make an effort. Buy something. Buy something if you can because you can find it cheap secondhand at, at military thrift stores. And it makes a huge difference in your play and how easy it is to spot you. Woodland, you know, all airsoft is essentially who can spot who first at range, okay, in range. But in woodland play, it's critical. It, literally all woodland play. Who spots who first? Hide and go seek and tag combined and you're tagging them with a BB. Okay, that's really at the end of the day all it is. And so many players, for whatever reason, don't like wearing camouflage. I don't know why. Because um, it really makes a huge difference in how well you play. That's the same reason I don't wear the the cool guy fast helmet crap when I when I play Woodland. I'll do it in CQB sometimes if the rules required for like vehicles and stuff. But for the most part, I don't like wearing a helmet because it makes you, the one thing you're peeking out that you have to peek out makes it a bigger target. Also, that really smooth round circle of that helmet is really easy to spot outdoors. Like you can just see them bouncing along. Well, there's somebody. There's that helmet. So, um, you know, the first thing about wooden play is be kind of camouflage minded. Um, you know, it's it's essentially a game of hide and seek on, on many many levels. So that's the first thing. Two, learn how to use a radio and use a radio. Uh, unlike CQB, outdoor play is more about formations and communicating with everybody. And if you're not communicating with anybody, all you can see all you all you can you're basically limited to what you can see directly in front of you if everybody on your team is using radios 
then you have the benefit of what everybody sees because they can tell you, hey, I see this over here or this over here or this over here. It is the biggest force multiplier you have in woodland play is using radios because then you can coordinate what you're doing. You can coordinate all your assets to one location or whatever location or coordinate so you can flank people and, and put more fire on a target, which sounds basic. It is basic. But without that, you got a bunch of individuals running out there just waiting to get picked off one by one. So number two, uh, use radios. Number three would be know the range of your AEG in, or whatever gun, uh, HPA, whatever. Know the range of your gun. Um, so when you're playing CQB, range really isn't that big a factor because most of the, the fields aren't big enough that you're going to run out of range before you hit them. Okay. Not so in the woodland. When you're in woodland, um, you got to know your range. Because oftentimes, you're going to see them long before you can shoot them. And if you don't know your range and you're engaging them, and you're engaging them at a range where you have a low percentage chance to hit, let's say it's – I'm just going to throw some numbers out here. Everybody thinks their guns shoot farther than they will – than they can. So my 400 FPS, you know, 1.48 joule AEGs, generally have an effective range of 175 feet okay and what i mean by effective range is i can hit a guy nine out of ten shots that's that's where i try to engage people in the effective range theoretically can it hit people out to 225 feet and maybe even a little bit further not much further yes i can hit people at 225 feet but it's about a one in ten chance and for the most part all i'm doing is is just, you know, praying that one of them gets lucky enough to hit them because the way airsoft guns work is at the end of their range, they lose a lot of accuracy, that last kind of 10% of their range, a whole lot of accuracy because of the hop up, putting backspin on it and blah, blah, blah. The point is, know the range of your gun and try to engage in the effective range of your gun, not the maximum range. For me, it's about 175 feet. Maximum range, about 225 feet. Do not engage at the maximum range unless you have to. Because you're just giving away your position. Once again, it's a game of who can see who first. You're giving away your position for a low probability shot. It's a bad choice. So that's three right off the top of my head. A fourth one I can think of is go prone. Um, the nature, one, whenever you're prone, prone doesn't really help you as far as accuracy goes with airsoft guns because there's not enough recoil for it to really matter. And the ranges that you're shooting at are not far enough where going prone is really going to help if that makes any sense might help a little bit but that'd be hard to measure uh shooting real steel rifles going prone makes a huge difference in your accuracy um what going prone does do for you is it makes you a much smaller target a much smaller profile and it makes it much harder for people to see you at a longer range usually if they can see you prone they're close enough that you can engage them in your effective range uh i learned prone was so effective by watching when i first started playing I played woodland. My background was all in CQB. I had no real world woodland training at all. And it was a uh, pretty steep learning curve. Uh, it didn't, it, it was tough. It didn't go the best for me the first couple of games, but it was a lot of fun. And I, thus I stuck with it and, and did learn. But I watched those who were good at it. I watched the more experienced players who knew. And I noticed um, one player in particular, his name was Damien. He always went prone. He went prone all the time and he was extremely effective and uh engaging targets and you know he told me hey they, they can't see when you go prone and by the time you see them you can shoot them so i started trying to go prone more often and i was a lot more effective so prone is extremely effective and with them play and a fifth one i'll think of a fifth one later maybe make a video of it but right now off the top of my head i'm having a hard time coming up with one and now i can catch up with the comments so can I do a sling transition video? Uh, what do you mean by transition? Do you mean transitioning to a handgun while using a sling? Uh, or do you mean transitioning shoulders while using a sling? Because if you're transitioning shoulders, I would recommend to use a one-point sling. You can do it with a two-point sling. It's not terribly difficult, but one-point slings are best for transitioning shoulders, particularly bungee slings. Did I mention that I'm making slings now? Okay, I'm pushing it. Slings. 
Okay, Mark, with the logo and patches, it's got to be Japanese, like Shogun Sling or something. Yeah, that could be. I, I could go for a Japanese, Japanese kind of theme. You guys have wondered what, what all the Japanese stuff's from. I've mentioned it in other videos. But when I first started training martial arts when I was 14, I did a hard style um, karate, a hard style bare knuckle karate that was called Bushido karate. And I was actually taught by an Irish guy named Mick Doyle. He was my coach for many, many, many years, still a very good friend. And I actually did his podcast. I mentioned it in the other live stream earlier. I did his podcast. He has a podcast called Gentleman Badass. It's a great podcast. He, he's, he does a lot better job putting this crap together than I do. But um, so he was an Irishman. But he learned from another Irishman who learned from uh, karate from a Japanese gentleman. So it was a Japanese style. But he was Irish. Whatever. When I first started doing bare knuckle, or bare knuckle karate, it was a uh, heavily Japanese influenced uh, do dojo. I called them gyms later, but um, and we did everything in Japanese. We did a lot. We spoke a lot of Japanese in the class and talked a lot about you know samurai mythology and stuff. So it kind of stuck with me. I was at the young and impressionable age of fourteen, and that's why all my all my tattoos are, are kind of samurai based you know and uh i got lots of samurai tattoos and thus the you know gunfather mill sim samurai stuff here so warrior culture far as camo those pants you did a review on i've been running for a while they are legit yes um the amazon knockoff pants that are cry precision knockoff pants that there there's like three different versions of it three different if you look on amazon there's like three different um manufacturers of it or, or brands of it but it's all the same pair of pants they cost like 60 or 70 dollars depending on where you find them they're excellent bernie what you run in these days for weapons uh honestly for the most part i'm just running my arcturus ak-105 which is basically an AK-74. Um, I really love the performance of that one, but I hate the battery space because it only uses a thousand. I can only put a 900 mAh battery in there, and um, it doesn't last terribly long. I can get through almost two games with it, but I got to basically change it out every game, depending on how much I shoot. On a normal normal uh, pickup game day, I can get two games out of it, and then I switch it out just in case. But we had a defense game last week, and I was just having a grip roar on good day where I went through basically all my mags and the high cap. I generally carry like five magazines, and my sixth magazine is a, is a high cap, and I call it my Alamo mag because if I get to that magazine, it's a last stand. <laughs> And uh, if, if, and you know, pickup games always allow high caps. I don't like using high caps because I like doing reloads. But um, if I'm having that good a game where I get to that Alamo mag and it's not very often I get to it, um, I go to that. And I damn near ran that 800 mile, 900 mile battery out a few weeks ago running that AK 105. The other one I use exclusively now is my Sima Platinum SR25. Love that gun. I brag about it all the time. Can't say enough good things about it. Mark, I play outside Arizona. We were starting a group here. People are finding out the importance of camo for hiding, but also tin helps you for not overheating as much. Yes. And I've been working the range all week. And here where I live in Omaha, it is about 95 degrees, 96 degrees every day right now, which doesn't sound like much to you people, to most people. But in Omaha, we have really high humidity, like 90% humidity. It is absolutely fucking brutal out there um and so wearing the correct colors is is crucial don't wear black you know wear white light gray tan makes a huge difference no like david and goliath sean desau and forgive me if i'm saying your last name wrong i'm, I'm horrible with names uh i think he's referencing switching slings i mean how to swing swim in and out of your sling maybe how to swing it around you're back to climb. I struggle with doing tasks at a mill sim and caught a few in my junk when transitioning. Ah, um, that's a tough one because if you got a one point, and I wear I use a one point most of the time in airsoft. Um, you don't really have to swim in and out of it. 
but it is what it is. You know, one point, that's the weak point of the one point. It's great for fighting. It's great for shooting. It's great for moving around. It's great for keeping your gun out of the dirt and it's great for comfort. And, and they don't take up a lot of space. They don't get in the way of your rig. You know, you can do all your reloads and stuff without having to worry about all this shit in your way. That's the, the strength of the one point. The issue with the one point is when it comes time to climb over or climb up something, they're a huge pain in the ass. And I mean a huge pain in the ass because that it's just bouncing around, you know, between your legs and, and hitting you in uncomfortable areas. And it, it's not good for that. For that kind of stuff, I rep recommend a two point or the advanced gunslinger hit sling, which is probably the best one for that. It is the best one for securing that weapon in a hurry. It's kind of cost prohibitive. What do I think of LMGs? Um, I've talked about LMGs before. I think the Crytek Shrike is pound for pound the best one right now because it is such a small package. The disadvantage of an LMG is it's big and it's heavy. Okay, no one wants to carry the big heavy gun, but the Shrike is so small, it makes it reasonable to use. I would recommend if you're going to use an uh, LMG, probably want to go HPA. Um, as much as I love my AEGs, you know, you're talking about a, you know, going full auto. It's just it's going to be a lot of reps on that piston, on that motor, and it's going to wear out faster than an AEG that would be shooting semi-auto. That's not to say you can't have a good one. That's an AEG. That's it's just from what I've observed, you're probably better off going with an HPA setup for an LMG. But it is, as far as the weapon classes go, where you got obviously riflemen, the standard ones, riflemen, DMR, um, support gun, and sniper. Support gun is the king of the field. It is the absolute biggest multiplier with with the exception of radios. It is the biggest force multiplier on the field is having a good LMG put in a good position where it can control many lanes on that field. You cannot beat an LMG. You just can't beat it. It, it is the win button for, for Airsoft. If you put a team of 10 LMGs, Versus like 10 riflemen, those LMGs are going to win that fight, you know, you know, every day, every day of the week, twice on Sunday. What do you use to help break up your silhouettes from Bloodshot 44? What do you use to help break up your silhouette? I run a light camo scarf tucked under my goggles strap. Um, it depends. A lot of time I don't do anything to break up my silhouette. I just run around wearing my camo and I let the camo pattern I'm doing wearing do the work. If and that's because usually I like to be aggressive and play aggressive and, and and be advancing. If I'm gonna be defensive and it's not holy shit hot, um I what the fuck do I use right now? I used to use a Cobra hood that I bought from Tactical Taylor, but I eventually got rid of that and sold it to somebody just because I didn't like it. Um, God damn it. I did a review on it. It came from some Russian company. It was similar to the Cobra hood. The Guyana Tactics Viper hood. That's what. And I purchased the strands of multicam that I use in that Guiana hood from the same from the same company. So Guiana Tactics, it's a Russian company. And uh, I really like that Viper hood. One thing I really like about it is it is multicam and the strips that I bought are also multicam. And I think I bought it for some op I was doing somewhere where you, they wanted your ghillie, ghillie to match the team faction. So I went with that and I'm really impressed with it. It's, it's really, it's very limited. Very small. It's basically just your shoulders and then a hood. And most of the time, I don't even wear the hood. But the, it, it really breaks up your silhouette around your shoulders. And when you're prone or leaning around cover, that's usually all you're going to show is your shoulders and your head. Um, the hood kind of has some holes in the side here. So you can look to your left and right and kind of see through those holes. So it's not quite as claustrophobic as many hoods are. I like that. And the hood also has a wire that runs through the the lip of the hood, which actually eventually I removed, but the wire was nice because it helped you adjust the shape of the hood. I just, I always wear a ball cap, so I don't have to worry about coming down too far. But that's what I use right now. Fog. I think we just talked about fog in the last uh, live stream, but uh, yeah, fog. I use Fog Tech wipes 90% of the time. 
if it's a very high humidity, uh, hot summer day, I will use my um, X Fog fan system on my with my goggles. Most time I don't have to use them though. Most days it's that's it's not uh, humid enough for it really be that big a problem. But uh, Fog Tech wipes, you know, they cost a dollar each. You can hand them around. Once you open the package, they're gonna dry out. Okay, so don't don't be greedy. Don't be selfish. Open it up. Use them on your own goggles and then hand them around to all your buddies around you. One fog tech wipe can get like, I don't know, 12, 15 pairs of, of iPro. And then everybody's good for the rest of the day with fogging issues for only a dollar. And you're going to make lots of friends at your airsoft game and everybody's going to like you. So fog tech, look it up on eBay or Amazon. They're, they're everywhere. I think Mark said something about a one point sling. And using a strap on your leg to strap the one point sling in place. I've seen people do that. Um, that's kind of like a 1990s Black Hawk Down era technique. I don't think people really do that much anymore. Maybe they do. Um, I've never had a desire to do it. Um, one point slings are great because you can fight on them. That's it. They're, they're, they're great for actually fighting with the gun, um, but they're not practical for all the other crap you have to do while carrying a gun. Mark Carrico, there's a video by Tactical Rifleman on Navy SEAL body armor setups that gave me the idea for the bungee retention for one point. I did a video on belt setups with how I did mine personally. Mark, can you send me a link to that video? Put it in the chat or uh, just uh, email it to me at gunfathermilsim.com. Or so sorry, .com. Gunfathermilsim at gmail.com. I would like to see that. Um, Sean DeSalle, have I tried any Novich products? No, I have not. Um, and I don't want to slander the guy because um, of all the airsoft personalities out there, he's probably the only one that really is making, you know, he's the one, he's the, he's the, he's the most popular really. And he's the one that probably makes, makes a lot of money doing airsoft videos. Lord knows I don't. Um, for those who are curious, I think I made $14 this month, one, four. <laughs> so, uh, uh, Norbridge, you know, the guys, uh, kind of found a way to make a lot of good sniper videos early on that brought a lot of people to the sport and figured out how to market himself and market some products. And, you know, you don't make money selling crap that you make yourself. Okay. And that, that's coming from a guy who has brought up the slings he's making, you know, three times this video. That's just play money. That's not like real money. That's not like income money, wealth money. Wealth money comes from finding people in China to make your product for you cheaply and then selling it at a lot of different locations, pushing product out there that somebody else is making. I'm never going to make a lot of money putting these slings together myself in my basement. If I... You know, you buy one of these, that this was made by me sitting in front of my TV, having a drink and putting this together with my own two hands. I'm never going to make a lot of money doing that. Um, the way you make money is, is the way Novich did it. My understanding is he takes um, basic guns and makes minor modifications to them, slaps his name on it, puts it in a nice case, and he sells it for a lot more money. Not uncommon in Airsoft. Um, everybody knows there's clones, everything. Look how many, look how many AKs out there are basically just Simas. You know, Echo One is all Sima. Um, all the other brands that use Sima AKs are escaping me at the moment, but you know, basic Sima gearboxes are in probably 70% of the AKs out there on the airsoft market. So, you know, it's really not that unheard of that someone makes a product they call unique when in reality it's just something else and they change a couple of minor things so people give them a lot of shit for that i don't understand why because that that is the airsoft market but just because his name is on it and he's the target he draws a lot of heat i mean echo one doesn't have a, a single guy that you can target a single player that came up with the brand the guy's trying to make money god bless him and honestly yeah he probably doesn't make that much money. He's probably not a millionaire. I'm, I'm assuming he, he he lives just fine, but something tells me he's not a millionaire. 
Maybe not. There's not a lot of money in Airsoft. Mark's playing catch up. Okay. Yeah. Bernie, no roots, just build your own serve. Yeah. Build your own gun. I, I I've always built my own sniper rifles and they they've turned out pretty well. What are you drinking? Scotch? No, I am drinking um what the fuck am I drinking today? Uh Jack Daniels honey whiskey. Jack Daniels honey whiskey is kind of my go-to right now. The chat here. Bernie. So, Rob, since sniper rifles came up, what should we look for in a sniper rifle, and how does it matter? Maybe why does it matter? What should we look for? Well, the first thing is sniper rifles are built. Okay, they're made. They're not. They're you don't. You don't. Uh, factory sniper rifles never really going to compete too much. You got to buy the right parts, invest the time in figuring out what works best, and uh, just shoot the damn thing a lot. So. You want a sniper rifle that has aftermarket parts support. If it doesn't have aftermarket parts support, it's a non-starter. It's just an absolute non-starter. Um, that's why so many people use the VSR-10. Tokyo Maru VSR-10 are the many clones of it because there's so much parts support for it. Um, the, I got rid of mine, but I had it for years, and I damn near rebuilt the entire gun at one time or another from parts. I think there was just the outer barrel was the only original part and the, and the stock. Um, second is the hop up, find a good hop up unit that has aftermarket parts support because most of your range and accuracy in airsoft comes from the hop up unit and the hop up rubber that you use. Um, also you're probably going to want to have a larger cylinder, that larger mass of air, larger cylinder means without getting into the drama of a uh, jewel creep, uh, Basically, you can get more power with less wear and tear on parts and less um, a weaker spring can get more power, kind of. Having said that, um, someone's going to have to help me out. What's the really affordable sniper that came out that uses basically an AEG size cylinder? <sighs> Elite Force came out with it, I think. They have like a, three versions of it now. In fact, the last one's the damn uh, pistol. Strike? Striker? That, that, that thing's really interesting. I kind of like it. Um, it's got good aftermarket parts support. And uh, it, it intrigues me. I, I don't really think it's like a long-term good choice for a sniper, but it, it, it looks like fun. Um, the current one I'm using is the Echo 1, or no, ANK M24 that I actually got from Burning. And uh, it works great. I just, I just stopped using it. Because I got that uh, Sima Platinum DMR, and the DMR is just a, such a stronger performer. Every time I bring out my sniper rifle, the guys on my team are like, Ugh, shit, he's got the sniper rifle because it's just not as effective. I mean, it's cool. It's fun for me. I can get a couple great, you know, it's it's very satisfying when you get a long range hit with a sniper rifle and airsoft, and you can watch that BB travel all the way in and hit the person. I mean, it's, it's satisfying, but it's not terribly effective. And I'm going to be more effective with an AEG every time. So they know, my teammates know that when they see me with a sniper rifle, I'm not going to be as effective as I would with a DMR or an AEG. They love my DMR. They love that Sima Platinum. When I bring that out the Sima Platinum, I can really hold down a pretty large area. Mark uses a Shema to break up lines, fold in triangle, tuck two parts in long side of blouse, and then if you need, you can pull it over your head. Lots of guys use shemags. I don't even know how to say that word. I never really got into them. Um, I have one like everybody else, but I'm we're not in the desert, so I don't use one. Sean DeSalle, my friend who went with me to the mill sim, did the sniper roll. He didn't. He didn't nearly have as much as I did. He was mostly just observation and target locations for us. Yeah, in in um, God, I don't really want to talk about real world sniper shit because anytime i talk about real world sniper shit it just kind of gets down a rabbit hole i'm a swat sniper a swat sniper is not the same thing as a military sniper military snipers stalk and shit they have, there's a whole mess of skill sets that military snipers have that swat snipers do not have there are a couple of skill sets that swat snipers have that military snipers don't. they're not exactly the same thing a lot of the tools are the same um, 
like I know how to make us, I don't know how to stalk. I've never been trained in how to stalk, but I've been trained how to make sniper hides and vehicle hides and all sorts of cool shit. Um, so it's not exactly the same thing. But for law enforcement, I could work a hundred careers as a SWAT sniper and never take a shot. It's extremely rare for a SWAT sniper to take a shot. And I mean, extremely, extremely rare. But um, the primary job of a SWAT sniper is observation in uh, telling everybody else who's on cover or whatever, hey, this is what's going on. Uh, I see this. I see that. This person's over here. It's observation and overwatch security on uh, site security details. So it's, it's just a little bit of a different role. But uh, actual, actual shooting for a sniper is extremely rare, in particular a SWAT sniper. Any game types that are better in the woods than in a CQB environment? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I, th I think really all game types are better in Woodland. I think Woodland's more challenging. A lot of people get, they win CQB games just out of dumb luck or fast feet. They're just, they're just, they just run fast and they get to a good position and wipe everybody out or just, you know, literally dumb luck. Um I think Woodland is more of a thinking man's game than CQB. And this is coming from a guy who loves CQB. CQB is my job. It's my passion. It's what I teach every day at work or most days at work. I love CQB. I'm going to adjust this. But I think Woodland play is, is more of a team sport. Um, just requires – it's like chess. And uh, CQB is like checkers. So what game types are better? Oh, God. Uh, even st simple stuff like capture the flag. I, I honestly, I, I say this all the time that all airsoft is varying degrees of attack and defend. All airsoft game modes, all of them, just varying degrees of attack and defend. Even like a VIP mission where you got to transport a guy from one location to another, that's just attack and defend and it's mobile. That's all that is. So um, I just think woodland play is more challenging. There's more skill sets involved in it. Um, it just adding the importance of communicating via radio concealment formations, all that stuff comes into play in Woodland and versus CQB, which is essentially just use of cover, controlling lanes um, to some degree pressure and flow, which you're not going to really, most airsoft guys aren't going to get. Um, if you know how to use cover well and you know how to control lanes, you're going to do well at CQB. Check your corners. Check your 90s when you move to a new piece of cover. Blah, blah, blah. Bernie says the Silverback Silverback TAC 40 fund will replace the VSR 10 very soon. The silver vol volume beat the table turning. Volume. I did briefly look at the Silverback TAC 41. I read some stuff online about it. Um, I think it's too early to tell. VSR 10 has been around a very, 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 very long time. There's a lot of clones of the VSR 10. It's just going to it's gonna take some doing for just for somebody to unseat the VSR 10. I mean, every, every couple of years, a new gun comes along that's going to be the VSR 10 killer. And as of yet, it has never happened. Sean to South Woodland all the way. I'm lucky on Long Island. We have three woodland fields, 30 minutes from me. One CQB location but attracts a bunch of hooligans and crybabies. Uh, you know me, I say all airsoft is good airsoft, but there certainly are some distinct personalities in the speed QB realm at times. So a lot of guys trying to buy skill, you know, with really fast shooting guns and blah, blah, blah. And I don't know, I'm going to stop. Any big airsoft event you eventually want to get to? Yeah, a lot of them. I'd love to go play at Balahack. I think that field looks really cool. I'd like to go play there. Um, I'd like to play at Copperhead, American Milson Copperhead. I'd like to play down in Texas. There's some big, what the hell is that That field called? It was like a big ren Renaissance fair place. It looked like a castle and shit. Um, I'd like to play down there. I think that'd be a great place to play. Um, I'm really, really busy right now. Uh, personal life, work life. I'm an academy instructor. We got to recruit academy in there right now, and it keeps me very busy. 
I'm, I'm literally on the range every day uh, teaching people. And uh, I'm getting married in two days. Yay. Uh, a lot of stuff with that. Um, trying to plan summer vacation with the kids and honeymoon and, and all that. So I'm, I'm really busy right now. And I just uh, don't have time to get out and get some big events. Lately, it's if, if a weekend game shows up where I have enough time to run out and do it real quick for a couple hours, that that's the best I'm doing this summer. It's been really a, kind of a shitty summer for big events for me. But I got a lot of other stuff going on. And, and honestly, um, as much as I really love Airsoft and it's a lot of fun, it's a low priority in my life. You know, uh, family and work have to have to take precedence over Airsoft every time. Kyle Warwick, very underrated channel and professional. Keep up the good work, sir. Thank you, Kyle. Um, I'm trying. Uh, I was I was texting a guy looking for some assistance on the the technical side of it. I was uh, Eric, who I mentioned earlier, on Saber Tees. I think he's in the chat. Um, I was texting him earlier, saying, "Hey, brother, I I need some assistance here because uh, you know I've been working on this channel for several years now, and it's just now getting to the point uh, over four thousand subscribers and blah blah blah." where it's just getting to the point where eh, getting too much for me to handle on my own. I need, I need some help. It's uh, I've been doing this too, too long to still be this bad at it, to still be this bad at the technology and the live stream. And I'll be honest, I'm probably not going to get any better at it anytime soon. I just need to have somebody come in and help me set it all up so I can just hit play and talk to you guys and it'll look a little more polished. Um, Jeez, how to talk about this. Um, in my opinion, a lot of airsoft channels out there, most airsoft channels are bad. They're garbage. They're, and I'm not going to name names, but it's it's just, you know, like unboxing videos. Fuck. You know, they're, they're fucking boring. And it's, it's guys talking about shit they don't know what the hell they're talking about trying to talk about shit they don't know what the hell to talk about, or they spend all the time talking about the aesthetics. Um, I think my channel is one of the few that talks about the tactics and, and real world skill sets that work in airsoft. Cause not all real world translates into airsoft, obviously a whole lot of it doesn't, but the parts of it that do um, CQB theory, use of cover, OODA loops, nobody else talks about that stuff. And that stuff is critical. Everybody's so obsessed with, you know, do you have this loadout or look at my impressionist kit of, you know, whatever. I will look at my new cool HPA gun, but nobody talks about the tactics and the skills and actually being a better player. They try to get better by buying better guns and, and faster shooting guns and better hop ups and blah, blah, blah. When all that shit is really only adjusting the last 5% of performance. And at the end of the day, your your ability to use real real world hard skills, tactical skills, is what separates you from everybody else. It's what's going to really win the day. It's not that new cool hop up, and nobody else is put is is really pushing that on channels. Not really, not on the airsoft side of things, because a lot of the real world guys kind of shy away from airsoft. I just happen to enjoy doing both, and um, so kind of the goal of my channel. It's not about Look how cool Rob is. I mean, who gives at the end of the day, who gives a shit? It's about the content. It's about the tactics. It's about the stuff I'm trying to teach. It's not about me. And if I can drag the sport kicking and screaming more into the tactical realm, then I'm happy. Away from the cosplay realm of things, which is fine. All airsoft is good airsoft. If the way you have fun is dressing up like whatever, then, then cool. You know, God bless you. It's, it's too small a sport for us to be making pigeonholing people into different groups and having fighting amongst the groups. Not cool. Okay. You have more in common with your average airsoft player than with anybody else out there. It's just that unique a hobby. But if I can drag the sport to some degree more into the tactical realm where people maybe are as excited about being in shape and learning the tactics and improving on their skills be as excited about that as they are about their new, I don't know, helmet, 
then then I'm happy. That's that's what I'm trying to do with my channel here. So thank you, Kyle. That was a meandering explanation. Have you done Milsim West? No, I have not. I've never done Milsim West because I live in Omaha. And Milsim West is very far away. I'd, I'd have to fly to go to a Milsim West game. And that, and I'm not a young man. And that doesn't sound fun to me. <laughs> I, I enjoy, I, I love going to eight hour Milsims or 12 hour Milsims. And then going back to the hotel room or going back to the campsite and having a couple drinks and having a good time with my friends. The whole let's do a 40 hours straight and we're going to camp in the field and I got to wear my goggles the entire time because I don't know when I'm going to be ambushed in the middle of the night and blah, blah, blah. If, if God bless you, if that's what you want to do and you're that hardcore, cool. I'm not that hardcore when it comes to airsoft. If I'm out in the cold and the miserable shit and I've done it, I better be getting paid because that's my job. Okay. That's, that's not recreation anymore. That's getting paid. I had one barricaded gunman uh, situation that went 17 hours and it was negative two, like the entire time. I think it warmed up to eight during the day and we were using fire hoses. So everything was wet and it was negative two. It was fucking miserable, but I was getting paid. And if I'm going to be miserable, I'm going to be getting paid. Cheers. Soon to be wife plate airsoft. No. Uh, no, she does not. She is a bit of a fitness nut. Um, yeah. She's she's a what we call an alternative model. She has a lot of tattoos. Um, she is a, an attractive young lady. I don't know what she's doing with me. I don't know what she sees in me, but she's she is infinitely more attractive than I, than <laughs> than than I am. I'm. I'm I'm probably a four. She's about an 11. Um, apparently she's got poor judgment and bad eyesight, but I don't know. I'm, I'm very blessed to have her in my life. She's amazing. If you guys, uh, she's not gonna be happy with this. She's starting an Instagram. It's basic metal Barbie. So look up basic metal Barbie. I think she's only got one photo on there. And if she's all of a sudden, she's still building the, the photo, um, enough photos to start posting stuff. But if you guys jump on Instagram and <laughs> go to basic metal Barbie, that's, that's my soon to be wife. Um, she's amazing. I'm going to leave it at that. I can, I can hear you guys furiously on your phones right now. Looking, <laughs> she's probably gonna be pissed. Sean, dude, yours is the only tactical channel. That's how I found you two months ago. Thanks, Sean. And uh, I, I, there's not many of us out there. I, I haven't found another one that, I haven't, and this is not to say that I'm I'm so fucking amazing because I'm not. There's lots of guys who know the shit that I know. I didn't make it up. I was taught by other people. Um, they're just not putting it out there on an airsoft channel is all. So lots of people know high threat CQB and all this stuff. It's 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 been around for a while. But I tried to bring it to the airsoft market. Jake Hansen. Hats off for sharing your knowledge, bud. Keep up the good work. Wow, Jake, you're checking in. I uh, used to work with him. Ben, yes, PT, PT, top tip of airsoft, PT. Yep, everybody wants to dress up like a Navy SEAL, but nobody wants to do the push-ups. Um, anybody that knows me, I'm, I'm a bit of a gym rat, even my advanced age. <sighs> Mark, definitely my favorite channel for airsoft. Found your videos through the SR25 video. Now I'm trying reverse tricep grip uh -huh. oh you're doing the counter supination <laughs> yeah oh counter supination everybody sees me holding my gun like this they think it's really weird because i don't do that traditional you know magpole you know c clamp grip out here uh funny thing i'm, I'm doing a shooting competition at the end of august i only do one real steel shooting competition a year and it's just this it's a law enforcement one that's to commemorate some fallen officers that uh, friends of mine that died years ago. And um, if you see me do that shoot, and I don't, I can't really, I don't know if I can, I don't like filming that shit because then I'm around my coworkers. And if you film it, you, they, they, they give me some, so much shit that I deserve to get 
if I were to film that stuff. But anyway, you know, you'll see me if I'm doing a long range shot in a comp shooting competition, I'll, I'll do that secret. Why? Because it, it stabilizes the gun and it makes it easier to shoot at range in a competition. But when you're working real world in the CQB, I do the secret because when you got to, you know, let's say you're clearing a mall, this, this isn't going to work clearing a mall. You're going to get very tired very quick. And I've done that. This, this, you can maintain your strength uh, a lot longer. This is a better grip for um, uh, weapon retention, all sorts of things. I did a video about it, the counter supination. It's funny, early on, early on my videos, I caught so much, like, like most of the comments were people talking shit about the, the Seeger. Why are you holding your gun that way? You need to hold it like this. You know, this is the only way to hold your gun. And it was just people who were just really kind of, I don't know, didn't have a, uh, I, I guess they didn't, didn't have a broad enough knowledge on there are other ways to hold a rifle that, you know, aren't endorsed by Magpul. <laughs> so bottom line is, are you hitting your target? Big reason I'm getting Mark Carrico. Carrico. I'm, no, I'm killing that. A big reason I'm getting back into airsoft is to get back in shape. As a disabled vet, working out is rough. But PT and tactics makes so much a difference. Yeah. Uh, anytime you can have fun while you're getting your, your PT in, like airsoft, you know, a good game of airsoft, especially if the weather's hot, man, it, it burns a lot of calories. It wipes me out. Um, I'm 42. I wish I could keep up like I used to. Like I started airsoft in my early 30s and, you know, still older than most players. But uh, I was 30. And I, I can't, I'm not as fast or as quick as I used to be just because getting old sucks. But I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing until the till the tires fall off. But yeah, PT, PT is critical. And you don't see a lot of people in Airsoft that embrace the, the PT aspect of it. And uh, kind of one of my pet peeves when people talk a big tactical game, but they're 50 pounds overweight. I'm like, Really? Like how 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 really dedicated are you to this warrior lifestyle that you're trying to sell to everyone around you, and then you're 50 pounds overweight, not buying it. Um, no. <laughs> so do what you can for as long as you can. Run as long as you can run. When you can't run anymore, bike. When you can't bike anymore, ruck. When you can't ruck anymore, crawl. I don't know. Do what you got to do to stay in shape. Um, I don't do the same workouts I did 10 years ago because I can't do the same workouts I did 10 years ago. There's more wear and tear on the joints, but I keep doing what I can do. There's there's 70 year old ladies who do marathons. I always tell myself that when I think I'm too old to do this or that. 70 year old ladies doing marathons. Rob, get out there and run your four goddamn miles. Ben 29, I'm getting the 18 minute three mile back, I swear. Brother, 18 minute three mile is moving. That's fucking moving. Uh, 18 minute three miles. Yeah, I, I never, even when, at my peak when I was fighting, the fastest one mile I could do was a 605, and I couldn't stack three of them. I never did get sub six. I'm not that tall, so I struggle with speed. Let's see. Just because I have it on the Adidas app. And I run a lot during the summer. During the winter, I work more on lifting. But during the summer, I, I do a lot more running. Progress. Let's see. Uh, tonight, I did a two-mile run. 17 minutes, 30 seconds. Uh, two days ago, I did a four-mile run. It was 34 minutes, 31 seconds. So that's that's about how fast I am. I run about an eight and a half, 8.45 mile. I'm not, I'm not a blazing fast runner. Sean, do you most go with the team or do you go solo most of the time? Most of the time I have a team. I have a team with me. Uh, my team's called, it's not my team, our team. It's called Fire Team 6. We usually field about four or five players, uh, sometimes six on a good day. It's mostly older guys, older players in their 30s. Um, I'm one of the older guys on it, but we have uh, – we have older players. Uh, Bernie was a former member. Bernie in the chat is a former member of our team. He was one of the older guys on the team, and he had a back injury and had to bow out. 
But uh, yeah, I usually play on a team, not a big team, but a, it's a really good guys, really good players who make me look really good. Um, I, if you follow Fire Team Six on Facebook or Instagram, um, I post photos on there. Actually, I don't think Fire Team Six has a Facebook page, but check the Instagram. I post photos of them all the time. No, fuck, we do have a Facebook page. What the hell am I thinking? Yeah, I post. Uh, I do most of the photos. I do a team photo every game we play. And uh, we have some really, really experienced airsoft players who do a good job of making uh, I play well because they're with me, basically. So uh, they're really good. Can you talk? Brooks Uger, can you talk about footwork related to moving and shooting? Footwork related to moving and shooting. So I got a really... Um, good friend of mine, my best friend, his name's Chris, and he is a no bullshit war fighter. Uh, army guy did contracting work for a while after he left the army. He was in Iraq in 2003 and then did contracting for years after that. And I would go to him for real world fighting experience, gun fighting experience, as far as war fighting goes. And I asked him one day, what's your advice on moving and shooting? And he told me, stop shoot what you're shooting, move. <laughs> that, that was his advice. And I, I think I find that probably is some pretty accurate advice. Just stop what you're doing and shoot what you're going to shoot and then move. If you're moving during a gunfight, you should be moving to a position of cover. Okay. And then once you get to that position of cover, you stop and, and you shoot what you, what your problem is. Now, if you want to buck some rounds at what's shooting at you, while you're moving to cover and it's safe to do so, and I'm talking real world now, if there's no danger in the backdrop, I, I'm a huge fan of it. Buck round, you, why should you be the only one who's scared? Fucking send rounds back the other way. But uh, as a general rule, um, I would I would be moving to cover. And uh, I've been told, you know, I've been trained and, you know, do the Groucho walk and, and you kind of roll your feet from heel to toe as you walk and you shoot in the flats. That's when you fire. Um, I don't think that shit is very realistic under stress when you're afraid and bullets are flying both ways. I, I don't, I don't think that's, that's very realistic at all. So um, generally stop what you're doing and shoot what you're shooting at and then start moving again. He was another guy. I asked. Him, I asked him about um, kneeling shooting. Like, what's What's your advice on on your best way to kneeling and shooting? And he goes, "Go prone." He goes, "If you got time to kneel, you got time to go prone and make yourself a smaller target than the guy next to you, and you'll be more accurate." I thought that was funny. It's funny when you when you seek out advice from like real world war fighters, they they sometimes give you like really short practical answers that you're not expecting and are most often true. Well, that's that's my two cents on moving and shooting. One thing I've been finding myself lacking is keeping my damn gun up. I might come around a corner with my gun at the low ready and get freaking blasted like an idiot. Then you're actually you're better off keeping your gun at the low ready as you come around a corner. When you come around with your gun up, unless you know 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 for sure there's a guy there. Um, you're better off keeping your gun at the low ready so you can see what you see. So you can see what you see before you do what you do. When your gun is up, you can't see down low as, as effectively. And it really doesn't take a lot of time to snap that gun up. Um, I would recommend, if you're having a problem with that, getting freaking blasted, apparently, as you come around a corner, quick peek that corner. And it's kind of one of those things where you peek and you, you come back as quick as you peek and then you go, well, what? What the hell did I just see? It's it's that fast. You don't even have time to really think about what you're seeing until you're back behind cover. Just yep, quick peek. Okay, what do I have? Is there a guy there? Okay, and then you come around and engage it, preferably at a different level or throw a bang in there or whatever. But because of the way OODA loops work and the fact that you're taking action and they're reacting, action is always faster than reaction. So if you do a quick peek and they're waiting to shoot you, they're not going to be able to shoot you. Assuming you come back out and in. If you go out and sit there and look, then they're going to hit you. So the, the, the point of the quick peek is to make it quick. So if nobody else has any more comments, 
I'm probably going to wrap this up for the night. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Thanks for having your patience while I continue to struggle with technology. And uh, I think we're going to shut her down. So thanks for watching. And everybody have a good night. Good night.